Okay. Um, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're joining us from, from today. Welcome to the African Scholars Initiative ASI Fire Chat or webinar. My name is Professor Gideon Christian. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Calgary Faculty of Law and also the president of ASI Canada. This is the first uh, inaugural edition of our new webinar of Fireside Charts Meets the Prof. And today we are very privileged to have um, a very prominent, bright, successful African scholar in Canada as our inaugural guest. Uh, this event is being hosted by the African Scholars Initiative. African Scholars Initiative is a Canadian non for profit organization that was recently designated as a charitable organization by the government of Canada. And our goal or objective is to mentor bright future scholars of African descent who intend to pursue graduate education in Canada. In our fireside chat today, we have with us Professor Chibwike Udenigwe. Professor Udenigwe is a professor and university research chair in food properties and nutrient biodiversity at the University of Ottawa in Canada. He specializes in food biochemistry. Professor Udenigwe received its BSc in biochemistry at the University of Nigeria in Suka. Thereafter, he left, Canada, uh, he left Nigeria for Canada, where he received his MSc in bio, his MSc in chemistry and PhD in food and nutritional sciences at the University of Manitoba. He was a natural sciences and engineering research council of Canada postdoctoral fellow at the University of Gulf in Canada. In 2012, he was appointed an assistant professor at Dalhousie University. And two years later, he was promoted to associate professor with tenure. In 2016, he moved to University of, uh, of Ottawa in Canada, where he is now a full professor and a university research chair. Professor, Udenigwe has published over 170 journal articles and book chapters. He was ranked by Stanford University as one of the top 2% of the most cited scientists in his field. Prof, we are very happy to have you in our program today. We thank you so much for taking time off your busy schedule. Of course, you're a very busy man, even though today is Saturday, you are still in the office. So we very much appreciate your taking time off your busy schedule to join us in this inaugural fireside chat. Thank you, Professor Christian. Uh, it's a pleasure, actually, it's a pleasure to join you today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Yes. So um, we are going to thank also for joining us once again. So we're going to start um, this um, conversation with some yes. so a couple of questions I'm going to be asking Prof. And then after that, we are going to open the floor to a question from the participants. So please, if you have any question um, for Professor Chibrike, please kindly uh, put your questions in the chat box. Uh, at the end of our initial conversation, Marianne is gonna read the, out the question and Professor uh, Chibrike will be replying to your questions. So in addition to this, I'll also invite the participants to please um, follow ASI on our social media handles for up-to-date programs, uh, webinars, and other programs that we host. Uh, Mariam is gonna be posting our social media handle on the chat box. We are in LinkedIn, um, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. So um, I've briefly, uh, Professor Chibika, I've briefly introduced you and uh, what I've just said is just a tip of the iceberg, iceberg when it comes to who you are. So let's get into details as to who is Professor Chibika. Now, can you provide us, um, tell us more about yourself, your educational struggle from a student at the University of Nigeria in Suka, so a postdoc fellow 
in Canada. Okay, uh, so thank you very, thank you very much. Uh, first, for the kind introduction, uh, but also uh, for the opportunity to speak uh, to ASI followers and the participants. Um, first of all, I would like to thank you for, for what you do, um, because this is actually very important and, and a very good way of uh, mentorship, you know, for people who want to be in, uh, in academia in Canada, but actually uh, this information you provide uh, is also relevant for people who want to be in grad school or post-grad uh, careers uh, anywhere in the world, because it's about the same, uh, the same uh, uh, information that is needed to thrive in this business. Um, so a little bit about myself. Um, okay, before I start, I would also want to mention that I haven't really shared um, anything about myself in public, only very few people that know me personally. Um, but uh, hopefully uh, doing this uh, would encourage somebody uh, who is struggling or maybe who uh, doesn't know what the future holds, you know, as they pursue their graduate program. Um, so I, I, I come from Enugu, Nigeria. I was born and raised in Enugu. And uh, I went to school at UNN, like you said. Um, so I ended up studying biochemistry. Um, and uh, some, sometime in my second year uh, of biochemistry, uh, I decided I, would, I was going to be a professor. Uh, so I decided very early in my, uh, in my career. I know a lot of people stumbled into this career, uh, but I planned mine. Um, and so we have different stories. Uh, so, see, so from my second year, I focused uh, on uh, preparing myself for this career, and uh, I did undergraduate research in Nigeria, which was not very common at that time, um, in my third year, and that research continued into my final year, and I was happy. Uh, at, in the end, I was able to publish two papers as an undergraduate uh, student. Uh, while I also attended uh, conferences, national conferences as an undergraduate student. So um, that helped me uh, from the onset uh, to start thinking about uh, my academic career and maybe start preparing for it. Uh, because then I had seen how competitive uh, it was to land an academic position, even in Nigeria at that time. Um, uh, but never, never for once did I actually think about studying abroad. I was just focusing on Nigeria. I loved UNN so much that uh, from my third year, I never went home for holidays. Um, I stayed in school and uh, not just studying, but also doing research with my mentor, my undergraduate mentor, uh, Professor Lewi Ezogo, um, who was you know, one of the best, actually still one of the best researchers in that university uh, in microbiology. Uh, even though I was in biochemistry, I found an opportunity in another department to do research. Uh, and he inspired me so much and uh, we spent Anybody that knows him knows, you know, it's a very rigorous uh, training environment. We spent the night, you know, working on research projects. Um, and I would say that was about the time that the hunger for research and academic uh, career, you know, grew. Um, so I became very involved. So that when I graduated, about that time, I started looking for opportunities uh, for masters. Uh, one of the conferences, a professor from uh, Usman Danfodia University, you know, um, very brilliant as a homologist, offered me a master's position. Um, say, when you graduate, I would like to, you know, supervise your master's degree. And I was very happy to do that. At the same time, a number of professors in my own institution offered me opportunities to come back uh, to uh, do graduate studies with them. Uh, and I also entertained those opportunities. Um, so when I finished um, undergrad, um, I ended up becoming um, the best graduate student in the Faculty of Biological Sciences. So both my department and the faculty. Uh, and uh, so I, I became, I was a very quiet student, but I was also a very active student. Um, I was the president of the um, National Association of Biochemistry Students. Um, the name has changed now. Um, and, um, and I was also the national secretary of, of the same uh, institute, the same organization. So I traveled around the country and I met so many lecturers and so many students and so many postgraduate students at that time that helped me actually decide on what area of our chemistry to specialize. And the one thing with uh, doing your master's degree is that you don't just decide where you want to go, right? Sometimes it's about the opportunities that are available at that time. So um, I grew up on the streets in Enugu. So I, in addition to being a book uh, smart, I was also a street smart. Um, so I thought about spreading my tentacles um, and uh, with uh, a connection I had already formed in Canada, Professor Michael Eze in Winnipeg, uh, I was able to find an opportunity to do my grad, my grad studies, my master's uh, in chemistry, organic chemistry. So that was totally different from what I had studied um, 
but uh, I was prepared because I took a lot of chemistry courses. Um, so I took that opportunity uh, midway in my service and uh, you know, went and started my master's in Winnipeg. Um, so after the master's, well, during the master's, about 11th month of the master's, uh, my committee recommended that I transfer to a PhD program in chemistry, which I did. I transferred successfully. Um, but the halfway into that year, I realized that uh, you know this is not what exactly what I want to do. I wanted something more applicable to uh, societal problems in the short term. You know what I was doing was relevant, but you know it was I wasn't going to see the outcome in my lifetime maybe. Um, so I thought about switching to something more practical. Um, and uh, then I approached another mentor. You know I hadn't met him at that time. I just walked into his office. And uh, he said, uh, uh, my friend, I have 10 minutes. You know, if you can say what you want to say in 10 minutes, I have a meeting I have to go to. Um, but I was prepared. So I actually prepared myself and I was able to uh, pitch my ideas. And I told him I was already a PhD student, but I was willing to start a new one. Um, and he accepted me uh, on the spot um, to do a PhD with him uh, in uh, food and nutritional sciences. Uh, my research focusing on protein and peptide chemistry. So not very different from what I was doing in chemistry, but doing it in a different platform, you know, food derived peptides and proteins. Um, so, so I uh, went back to, master, up to my uh, chemistry department and informed my supervisor, I was willing to switch back to chemistry. So I reverted to chemistry masters and uh, graduated. So I could start the new PhD uh, in uh, food and nutritional sciences. Uh, so it was a very good experience. I had a very good uh, mentorship, uh, which we'll talk about uh, maybe uh, sometime uh, during this uh, um, webinar. Um, but uh, from there, the story, you know, wh whatever I, become, I became eventually, that's actually where everything uh, blossomed. And uh, I had a, so I did a PhD for three years. And during my PhD, I think about second year of my PhD, PhD, I told my supervisor I was applying for a postdoc fellowship, NSEC postdoc fellowship. So he thought I was crazy. Um, but uh, I usually like to assess myself and I feel like if I feel like I have a good shot, I go for it, irrespective of the norm. Um, so he allowed me to apply and I was actually offered an NSEC postdoc fellowship when I was in my third year of a PhD. Because of that, my committee uh, asked me to pull my papers together and defend. I hadn't actually finished my PhD research, but at that time I had published uh, six papers and they said, uh, put them together. Uh, they might not be related, but put them together and make a thesis. So that's how I made my thesis. Um, that thesis eventually got me the University of Manitoba uh, Distinguished Dissertation Award. Um, and eventually I proceeded to go off uh, to do a postdoc. Um, so while I go off, as a PhD student, actually, I started applying for faculty positions. So I knew I was not going to get it. Uh, but that first year, um, I got a lot of interviews, um, oral interview, what do you call it? Phone interview, phone and video interview. Nobody called me for the campus interview, but I, I use it as a chance to practice. So that then in my first year as a postdoc, I got an offer to become an assistant professor. So I did postdoc for one year uh, at Guelph, one year and a little bit, I think uh, one year and three months. Um, and then I accepted that offer at the Housy Agricultural Campus in Truro, Nova Scotia. Uh, so I moved, I moved with my young family uh, to Nova Scotia to start a new life. And then the rest is uh, just like you said, you know, after two years, I got promoted and tenured. Um, and after two more years, that's a total of four and a half years, um, we decided to look for a greener pasture. Uh, then we moved to Ottawa, which offered us uh, another opportunity to look at the different aspect of my, my, my research, but also for my wife to also pursue her career. Uh, so that is uh, the brief history, the shortest uh, form of my, my, my move from uh, uh, University of Nigeria, Asuka. Yeah, that was, indeed a very, that was indeed a very brief history, but filled with a lot of um, lessons for, you know, for uh, participants here, because I mean, from what you've said so far, it was it's very obvious that um, you were a bright student, even from your undergrad level. And, you know, I mean, even as an undergrad student at the University of Nigeria, you've already started exhibiting those brilliant scholarship qualities, attending research conferences, conducting research, even as a third year student, which is very unusual, right. you know, so and you know, in ASI, our idea or our objective is to kind of um, look out for 
you know, student that has these bright qualities, which you exhibited, and there are a lot of them out there, you know, being able to provide them with the necessary information they need in order to kind of climb this ladder that you have, you know, go through these steps that you have taken. And also at least with as much minimal challenge uh, as, I mean, there will always be challenge there, but, you know, being able to equip them to handle those challenges when they arise. So, and that will now um, take me logically to the next question I want to ask you. And my next question is, what were the challenges you faced as a graduate student in Canada? And how were you able to overcome those challenges? Okay, uh, thank you. Um, I, I was the type of student that uh, wouldn't say, naturally, when I was in Nigeria, I wouldn't say that I faced any challenge academically. Uh, things came uh, easily uh, to me, so I never struggled you know, uh, in any way in whatever I studied. So I came to Canada with that mentality, you know, that you know, I, I'm amongst the very best. So I, I will ace this thing, you know, when I come here, I'm going to learn everything and I'm going to become one of the best. Uh, but when I came, um, things were different, you know, so there was first the culture shock. Uh, the culture shock, not necessarily because I wasn't familiar with the Western way uh, of uh, living. We're all from Nigeria, so we, we know everything, you know, English is our, our official language and, you know, uh, we have pretty much everything that is here in Nigeria. But culture shock from the sense that uh, then people started looking at me uh, differently because, you know, I'm not now part of a majority. I'm not part of a minority. Um, so culture shock in the sense that the expectations that people had for me were less than what I was used to because, you know, they see me as a Black student here. They thought, well, you know, we're supporting somebody. You know, you may struggle. You, maybe you don't understand what we're doing because you're from a different environment. Uh, so it really affected me negatively because, um, you know, I, I always go with open mind and uh, putting myself in any environment. I am very competitive, um, not in a very bad way, but, you know, in a way of challenging myself to overcome any barrier. Um, so I still disregarded some of these um, what I call microaggression. There were many of them. Uh, so because these things could actually weigh you down, you know, from looking at it from afar, you might not uh, be very concerned about this, but when, you, when you're in the system and then you want to compete and then you are kind of treated differently because people think you're not competitive enough, um, then you start, it starts affecting you, especially if you're a really good student. It, it affects you one way or the other. But I kept a positive attitude uh, to everything. I had really great mentors. Um, and that helped me. And of course, with family support, that helped me um, uh, push because I really know where I was going. I had a plan for myself. Like I told you earlier, I had already planned my career uh, even from the beginning. Uh, so because of that, I kept the eye, my eye on the goal uh, and it helped me overcome that. I'll give you an example of the microaggression. Uh, the first time I applied for a TA, um, I wouldn't mention names, but somebody in a position of authority yes okay. somebody in a position of authority was worried that i wouldn't be able to teach that course because my of my english uh even before meeting me uh, they hadn't met me you know um so they were just saying it to another professor who told me why I, what the reason why i couldn't teach that course was just because uh that person thought i you know my students might not understand me so i thought that was a, that was that was a bit uh of putting because really I was hoping to teach that course. I'm a biochemist to the core and it was a biochemistry course within the chemistry department. So I thought I'll teach this and I'll ace it because I have biochemistry running in my blood, you know? Um, but uh, I, I ended up teaching, uh, uh, becoming a TA in an organic chemistry course, you know, which was a big shock as well because I'm not an organic chemist. Uh, but, you know, this will tell you, you know, the kind of uh, a discriminatory experience, I, uh, discrimination I experienced in the beginning that started affecting the way I viewed things. Um, of course, the, 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 the Canada provided a lot of opportunities, you know, but then some of these challenges are there and people don't see them uh, because the majority doesn't experience it, just a very minority experiences it. Um, and uh, so since then I started you know, becoming a little more focused and observant just so that uh, when I see some of these attitudes, I kind of disregard them uh, and try to focus on, on my, my goals. Uh, the second one is about uh, the practical side of things. You know, if we're from Nigeria uh, then and now, you see that we do a lot of theories. 
Um, so I had learned so much about biochemistry, but then I hadn't seen some of the equipment before. So when I came here, <laughs> I saw a lot of things I hadn't seen. I had read a lot about them, um, so that was good. Uh, but then I had to put my head down you know, the first six months to learn. I didn't say anything, nobody knew me. I was just basically soaking up information because I needed to learn so quickly in order to adjust and be able to fit in properly, especially with respect to the research side of things. Uh, so those were the two major challenges I, I would say that I faced. So many challenges as an international student, ranging from funding, you know, you, you get your scholarship, or then you apply for RA or TA, research assistantship or teaching assistantships. Uh, some even had to work outside the campus, you know, in order to survive, uh, just because um, of the international student fee, as you know. Um, but uh, I didn't have to do that. I had enough, just enough uh, to survive. And I tried to focus uh, on what I came for, knowing that this particular period was temporary uh, and that I have to maybe have to work really hard in order to advance and then get out of that situation. Um, so these are the major challenges I faced as an international student. Um, but like I will talk about later on, I, I had a yeah. lot of support. I have a very strong support network uh, to help me uh, overcome you know, some of these challenges. So let's talk about your support, this support network, and which is very important. I mean, there's no yeah. doubt about it. Um, I mean, as um, students of, uh, as a student, as a black student, students of African descent, I mean, Canada has come a long way, but we cannot deny the fact that there are still elements of uh, discrimination in the yeah. system. And um, in the academia, we are the minority, so um, uh, uh, it, 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 it's part of it. Be, I mean, it's part of being minority to expect right. to be discriminated again. Right. But you talked about mentorship. How, can you elaborate further? How important was mentorship to you? How important did that role play to your success as a graduate mm. student? It is very important. It is very important. If you remove mentorship, I don't think I would be where I am today. Um, and uh, mentorship comes in different ways. You know, people always think that the mentor is somebody who is bigger and better and more, you know, um, you know, more well known in the society. Uh, no, that doesn't make a mentor. Uh, what makes a mentor is actually somebody who you're able to talk to and they give you relevant advice that will help you get out of that situation or get better or you know overcome the challenge you're facing or achieve the goal you set for yourself the person might be bigger uh, might be equal uh, might be smaller than you you know so it doesn't really matter it just uh, that person has the ability to or the knowledge and experience and ability to advise you you know so i've had so many of those uh, some of them know that they were my mentors um but others they don't i just look up to them from from afar uh, at every level of my training, from my undergrad, I had admired so many people who were better than me. Um, and I didn't know eventually I would become the best graduating student because honestly, those guys were better uh, in the beginning, maybe, you know, um, but they made me work so hard uh, because I was trying to catch up. I was trying to become like them. I was trying to achieve the level of knowledge they had. And in doing that indirectly, I didn't know that I was enriching myself to the extent that I became better uh, uh, in the faculty uh, at that time as an undergraduate student. Um, and then the second level of mentorship uh, were people who were older than me, uh, who were more experienced, who had what I had. And I said it early, I contacted professors in my second or third year of university, um, like I told you earlier, from Nigeria. So I was looking for opportunities in Nigeria. So I contacted people outside my university who I met at conferences. But I also contacted people outside Canada, uh, outside uh, Nigeria. Um, so in the UK, in US, uh, in Canada and Australia, mostly English speaking countries uh, that I thought were advanced that would have all the facilities for me to do my work. Um, and one of the former professors in Nigeria who became a professor uh, in Winnipeg, um, you know, replied and uh, he became my mentor. I didn't ask him for graduate studies opportunity. I was just trying to connect uh, because I really needed some advice. I said, what do I need to do now in my second or third year? in order to help me prepare for a future career in academia. He was very excited. He replied within an hour, you know, um, and actually mentioned something like, you know, many people writing him asking for positions, but, but nobody has ever asked him for advice, you know, um, and we maintained that contact for two years, you know, without me asking him for anything. Um, and, uh, and then one day he now suggested, why don't you apply to study abroad? I said, I am already doing that. It's just that I don't want to bother you. You know, he eventually became the link that helped me get my master's opportunity, but I never asked him. He was the one that suggested it. Um, so 
it's good to, that you have mentors, but it doesn't mean that you should burden them with your problems. Uh, you have to use them creatively because they, they are time. They don't have time. Their time, time is precious. Um, and, uh, and then you have to have an open mind to that uh, mentorship, uh, mentee, mentor uh, relationship, because sometimes you, we are caged in what we are thinking is like a very good opportunity for us but sometimes when you're open-minded then you see a lot of people come with better ideas in terms of where you could be going in your life you know, because they see the opportunities and they also see your strength and they will be able to match both because at some level you are inexperienced and they have better experience so they foresee where you could go and then they help guide you towards those paths um my mentorships basically uh, helped my mentors basically helped me consolidate my plan because like i told you earlier i had very strong plans about where i was going but through my mentors i was able to know that i could achieve these goals because they were some of them were in that, those positions uh, and sometimes you know some of them looked like me so they had also had some of the challenges i had and they told me that that don't worry about it just keep going before you know it, you know, you're a graduate and then before you know it, you're a professional and then you have a position of authority and then you can change some of those things. And, and truly these things happened. Um, so throughout my graduate studies, I relied on these mentors. They're not in my field. Uh, some of them were, most of them were not. Um, and I maintained very solid connection with them. Um, and then some of them that were here would invite me over to their house as an international student, you know, you were by yourself. Um, and then you go there and eat some really good food, <laughs> you know, um, uh, Nigerian yeah. food or, you know, whatever culture they come from. Um, and and uh, so that they also formed a social network, you know, uh, to provide support. Because like I said, as an international student, sometimes you get lonely. Um, of course, before I had my family. Um, so those mentors were there um, to support me academically, but also to support me socially uh, and help me navigate uh, some of the challenges I faced as a graduate student. Yeah. Well, that's, um, yeah, that, that's, I mean, I, mentorship is very important, uh, of course. Um, but one thing I, I also noticed in your own case, I mean, you already have your plan prepared, you know, you needed these mentors to kind of help you build on that plan. Right. So when you talk about mentorship, you don't just go with no plan and seeking for somebody to help you develop one. So it's important to kind of, you know, have a plan, start thinking about something, then look for people who will be relevant to that feel or that plan you have so that they can be able to help you build on it. Because uh, when you go looking for a mentor with nothing, you won't expect, the idea of mentor is not for somebody to kind of, you know, dig you out of a hole. It's the fact that you have a plan to get out of that hole. You just need somebody to kind of help you build on that plan. So that's very important thing also to look into when you're looking for a mentor. Or, or for a mentor or for mentorship. Now let's quickly go to your academic career. I know you've um, spoken a little about um, the career. Um, can you tell us maybe very briefly, uh, what was the experience like searching for and getting your first uh, academic appointment as an assistant professor? What obstacles did you face and how were you able to overcome them? Yeah, thank you. Um, so that one is also a long story. Um, like I told you, um, I started applying very early and that uh, people don't usually do this, especially in my field. Uh, the, normal, the normal procedure or process is that you finish a PhD, which usually takes about four years. Um, and then you do a postdoc, two years. You know, sometimes you do a second one, another two years. And in some cases you do a third one, uh, another two years. So usually about four to six years after your PhD, uh, then if you're lucky, if you're one of the the top ones or fortunate ones, uh, you'll be able to land your first academic job as an assistant professor or uh, you know, a research career in industry or, or a research career in the government or maybe other career opportunities that, that, uh, that need a PhD but are not necessarily research, research related. Uh, in my case, um, you know, like I told you, I always spread out, you know, I spread my tentacles um, everywhere. I was determined to uh, have a, an academic career because that is the only thing I knew and I had prepared myself for. Actually, still the only thing I know. Um, so, but then in the beginning, it was actually very depressing. You know, the academic job market is, is not very good at the moment in North America, but also in many places in the world. Um, I was applying to, to the extent that I told my wife, you know, maybe we'll maybe have to leave Canada. Uh, I was applying to the US, uh, Australia, and the UK. These are mostly places that I interviewed. 
um, like I said earlier, English speaking countries where I will still have an opportunity to do advanced research. Um, and at some point I said, what's case scenario I'll go back to Nigeria, um, but uh, that would have been the last, uh, last option. Uh, but um, I started early. So I started in my second year to apply, second year of PhD, you know, so that people don't do that. But like I said, I don't do what people do. I have my own way of doing things. And I feel like if I try it and it doesn't work, then I try again, it doesn't work. I gain experience each time I do things. And the next time is gonna be different. So I don't wait until, you know, when the timetable says we should do it. Uh, sometimes I was, I'm just trying, uh, but I was just trying and I landed a position trying, you know? So um, the first opportunity I got for interview, I was in my third year as a PhD student and it was in the US and I interviewed on the phone and, and I, I, I messed everything up completely as expected. That was my first opportunity to ever speak. I was really nervous. Uh, my uh, colleagues were busy preparing for their comprehensive exam or trying to publish their first paper. And I was talking about interviews for academic jobs. So I had nobody to uh, talk to, you know, so I didn't have that network of people looking for a job to, to, to learn from or to share experiences with. Um, so, but then from that failure, I learned a few things. And each time I do a phone interview or a video interview, I got better. Uh, I would actually record myself on the phone um, to see the mistakes I made um, and then to see how I can correct it. For every opportunity, I put in hours, you know, changing my CV, changing my uh, teaching philosophy, my research statements, uh, changing my cover letter. It took me hours for every single opportunity. So I put in a lot of time. Um, while also doing full-time work as a researcher, and I had a young family uh, with uh, two babies. Um, so that, that was very strenuous, a very strenuous process. Uh, but luckily, as a postdoc, I started getting more interviews in the first year of my postdoc. And this time around for on-campus interviews. So that means I have passed the first step of screening, and then they will invite me as one of the last three candidates out of maybe 50 or 100 people that applied. So I started getting on-campus interviews, uh, in one instance, in somewhere in the UK, I'm not going to mention the name of the university, I was ranked as the topmost candidate, but uh, because I was not from the EU, uh, I wasn't a priority. They had to offer the job first to an EU citizen, and if they declined, then they could offer it to a non-EU. So I missed that opportunity, and I wept, really, because I really you know, envisioned the whole thing, planned out how we're going to move to the UK to start this job. Uh, but uh, for every failure, I count it as an opportunity to grow, uh, to learn and grow and become better at what I do. Um, so I took all those experiences and bottled them up uh, that, you know, when I interviewed for my first academic job, I was already a star. You know, I knew everything. I knew how to address their questions. I knew how to ask them questions, you know, because sometimes you want to get a job and then you're sucking up, uh, but you don't know how to genuinely engage. Uh, but at that time, I had confidence because I'd done it so many times. Um, and I was able to engage uh, with them. After, after they asked me questions, I had to ask them questions. Right? Because at that time, I was also looking out for myself, for my family, for my career, just to make sure that I'm choosing the right job. Just like they are also trying to make sure they are choosing the right candidate. Um, so after that interview, I think there were six candidates for one job. Six candidates interviewed, uh, they told me, uh, for one job. And uh, eventually I was, um, uh, I, I was selected you know, as uh, the, the best uh, somebody to offer the job. And I was really excited. That was December 17th, uh, 2011. I remember that day, you know, so I was excited to get the offer. Um, and uh, by January, I signed the offer, first week of January. And then I wrote uh, the postdoctoral fellowship uh, people, NSEC, telling them that I'm going to discontinue my postdoc fellowship because I still had a year left. Um, and they asked me to write them a check and return the money they gave me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was happy to do that. I wrote them a check. And uh, mm -hmm. then uh, on uh, April 1, I moved to Nova Scotia. April 1, 2012, I moved to Nova Scotia to, to start my, my, new, my new career. And that's at Dalhousie University. At Dalhousie University, yes. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, maybe we should use this opportunity to give a big shout out to Dalhousie University for offering you that post, which of course kept you in Canada. We're happy that we did not lose you to UK or Australia or US. But um, uh, I mean, it's, it, 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 it's a pride to have, you know, brilliant scholars like you here. And, you know, and it's important to highlight here that you didn't just land your first job. 
you had series of interviews. There were many failures before you were able to hit that success mark. So, uh, and the good thing about it, you weren't discouraged. It could hard sometimes when you miss those opportunities, but I mean, each time you, you fail, what you did was that you learned from the failure and built on it. And um, I think that was one of the hallmark of, of where you are today of, or your success today. Yes. Now, um, yeah, so thank you very much for uh, sharing, you know, this thought with us. Now, let's now go back, of course, uh, we've talked so much about you and your career uh, trajectory, how you got to where you are today. There's no doubt about it that you are an accomplished scholar in Canada today. I mean, we're not saying you should stop here. Please keep the flag flying and, you know, keep flying higher. But you have, you know, flown that high that... We can flout you today as, you know, yes, this is one of us, a very successful, brilliant scholar of African descent in Canada. But now another important area I would want us to talk about is those other Chibri case out there, those other brilliant emerging scholars out there. Canada is a choice destination for graduate education for bright and emerging scholars of African descent. And these scholars go through great deal of hurdle in realizing their dream to pursue graduate education in Canada. From admissions struggles, securing supervisors, to even funding their education in Canada. In fact, one of the poll we had in our Twitter page, that is African Scholars Initiative, one of the poll we had on our Twitter page asking participants to identify one of the greatest obstacles to their dream to pursue graduate education in Canada. 80% or more actually listed funding as one of the obstacles. So for the purpose of um, graduate admission, what I probably want to get from you, I mean, and of course we have this, of course, these bright scholars participating in this webinar. So I want to kind of, you know, want you to speak to them now, advice that you can provide to them in areas relating to grad admission, contacting and securing, contacting prospective supervisors and uh, securing grad supervisors and funding. So let us start with the first one, which is um, grad admission. You have been a member, of course, of uh, graduate admission committee. Now, as a member of this committee, what advice can you offer to these bright future scholars who are seeking to pursue graduate education in Canada? What should they do and should they not do when it comes to seeking graduate admission? How, what do they need to do in order to put the best graduate admission application based on your experience serving in this committee or similar committee? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's a very important question because I think that is usually the biggest uh, bottleneck. Uh, so people apply and they don't get admitted. Um, uh, and uh, so that there, there could be uh, many things uh, that led to a success, a successful application or an unsuccessful application. So everything is uh, depending on the department. Um, so at Dalhousie, I was a graduate advisor for my department. So I reviewed so many applications. And here in Ottawa U, I was a director of graduate programs in our new uh, School of Nutrition Sciences. So I have an idea um, what it might be. So in my uh, field, uh, a graduate application um, that is not targeted at any particular supervisor uh, is often very difficult and challenging um, uh, to assess, not to just assess, but generally to become successful. It would be very difficult uh, because in most instances, you would have secured a supervisor and then your supervisor would then ask you to apply. Okay, so in that case, you put the name of the supervisor in the file and all we are doing is just basically checking to see that you met the minimum requirements, which is a minimum CGPA requirements. Um, and then the rest, I don't think it's our business because it's mostly the supervisor that screens you and then determines whether they wanna take you or not. Uh, and what one thing the supervisors are looking for, um, in addition to your GPA, uh, which should meet the minimum requirement, typically 75%, uh, what, they, what else they're looking for uh, is basically your research experience and inputs, uh, what you've done so far, whether you have published any papers, 
uh, which can be challenging for scholars coming from uh, some countries. I, I come from Nigeria. So for instance, people coming from Nigeria, not very many people have the opportunity to do research as undergrads. But if you're still an undergrad, then this is a chance for you to start looking at it, okay? Because then, you know, you can start early. Um, or if you're doing masters and you're thinking about PhD here, then you should start you know, looking at making some contributions from your research, uh, publishing, and it doesn't matter the journal, as long as it's a respected journal, um, uh, the, the most important thing is that you're making some contribution to your field. So you can build on those contributions while writing your statement of interest, for instance. So you can mention some of your accomplishments and some of the contributions you've made to the field. And that will make you stand out because a lot of people don't do research at that level. Um, and if you have done something, that makes you stand out. Uh, if you haven't done something, then you could write about um, an area of interest of yours, but relevant to research that is ongoing in the department. I receive so many emails and people are telling me they want to work with me and they are quoting a research that I don't do and nobody in my department even does. So that tells me that they haven't done their homework, so they haven't checked to see. Um, and people can be busy. For instance, you know, uh, on a normal day, I get about five emails requesting to do master's, PhD or postdoc in my lab. Uh, but then on a busy day, say for instance, I win an award and they publish it somewhere online, I get about 10 to 15 emails every day from people because they saw my name. So they didn't know me before, maybe then they saw my name and then they start asking me uh, for grad program. Not Nothing wrong with that because we see opportunities as we go. But the biggest issue I notice in majority of those cases is that they don't understand my work. Um, and some people don't even have the background to do my work. Like I can offer you an admission, but you cannot survive in the program because you don't have the background. You cannot. I give you the lab, give you all the equipment, and you will not do anything because you don't know it. You know, so it's good that you are realistic in the way you are approaching grad program, I know, or when you're requesting for supervisors, that you make sure that your expertise and your background, what you've studied, fit, you know, with the program that you want to pursue. So that if given the opportunity, you know that you have the necessary background. So the admission committee or whoever is evaluating your supervisor is looking for those things uh, to know whether you have the right background to be able to make this successful. Uh, you know, when people see scholarships, they think it's free money. Uh, it's not. Um, is it that we got the money from a funding agency or there is an endowment that gives the money? But there's an expectation that that money will yield results. So if given to you, I give you, give you, give you the admission, give you the money, that in the end, you're going to produce something, you know, make a discovery from your research, not just make A's in your courses and graduate, but you're going to produce something. So in assessing candidates, we're looking for the person that has the highest likelihood of producing something, you know, out of the investment we're going to make in them, you know, and the only way you can assess that is by GPA to make sure they have the right academic background, uh, but also uh, from past research experience to make sure that they have done something uh, or if they have won scholarships before, you know, because, you know, unlike in some places where scholarships are given based on financial needs, uh, here scholarship are given based on excellence. So the more you win, the more you get. If you win a scholarship, you're likely going to get another one and another one. So that's why you see people with all the money and somebody with nothing. Um, because the committee grades the past successes in securing scholarship as an advantage. So they, they use it to add to the points. Um, so all this put together um, uh, are very important uh, in uh, distinguishing you from amongst the other candidates uh, for graduate opportunities or for admission, all right? So your, your academic background, your research experience, uh, past scholarships that you've won, uh, statements that you've written and how correct they are, ability to identify the right research opportunities relative to your strength. Um, and when somebody sees all those things put together, there's no way they can they will just overlook your application. That is how I select people. And, um, and I just basically just, you know, grabs my attention and I have to, you know, give them a call you know, to know what else they have in stock. Um, so it, basically when you're putting a package together, what you should be doing is to stand out, not to sound like everybody else. Um, the more you like, copy stuff from the internet or have people review your uh, uh, proposals, I mean, people can review it, but they shouldn't rewrite your stuff because then when, when it happens, you have lost your personal connection to that story. Uh, and then you begin to sound like everybody else. Um, you know, you have to be unique. You know, you have to be unique. You know, you have to do your own statement to bring out what you really want. If you don't get that opportunity, 
I don't feel like it's a failure. It's not a good match and you don't want to be there because if you're put in a wrong place, you're not going to enjoy that opportunity. Um, so if you don't get it, then you keep trying because there is a right match, right? So you keep trying until you find the right match. It's not just about getting admission, it's about getting admission at the right place with the right supervisor, working on the right project. Then you're going to have a really good time doing grad school uh, because graduate studies is very stressful. Uh, very, very stressful. So you're doing some labs or groups and you're not going to enjoy it at all. Um, some people drop out of the program. Some people have issues. Um, some people have uh, mental health issues just because of uh, graduate, the demands of graduate program, um, uh, which is not supposed to be like that. But it's just like the environment you found yourself might not be positive. And then that would definitely um, impact you negatively. So you want to make sure you have the right places that could support you positively towards your academic goals. So, um, so I jumped a little bit. So in addition yeah. to getting yourselves ready for the admission committee, you should also uh, be ready to accept any uh, negative uh, news. I like say you don't get the position uh, because it might be good for you. Um, all you need to do is just keep trying. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, there's no doubt about it that you're definitely going to be getting more requests after this because uh, I believe um, uh, a lot of people out here have admired your brilliance and your success and they'll probably want to relate to that, especially those who are here who are in the area of food science, uh, which of course is your specialization. So we have Professor Chibike's LinkedIn um, um, uh, contact on the chat box here. So please feel free to connect with him on LinkedIn. Now, going back to my question, uh, Chibike, uh, I, some grad admission, especially in your area, in the sciences, of course, like you noted, requires that you secure a supervisor first before applying. And this, of course, will require the students or the prospective students or applicants contacting the supervisor. Now, I know you've made mention of You've said something about contacting supervisor. So what for the advice, narrowing down to this contact with supervisor, what for the advice will you um, give to the participants here? You said you normally receive on an average day five of such contacts in some days 10. So among these ones you receive on daily basis, which one are you most attracted to and which one do you quickly send to the junk, um, to the trash box? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, that's a very good question because I think that is the biggest, um, uh, I think that is the biggest part, the, the most important part of your uh, journey to grad, grad schools, contacting your supervisor if you are in this uh, field. Uh, actually in most fields, for instance, even if you're gonna get admitted directly, you may wanna start talking to people uh, so that when, you get admitted, then you already have secured somebody that you're going to like, most likely going to work with. Um, I say this is the most important part because um, the majority of the email I received, like I mentioned earlier, are not a product of careful research, right? So the, the, the candidate just basically copies the email address and copies something they have written before and just change my, change the dear doctor or professor. So I can even see it, the font of the dear professor is Times New Roman and the rest of the email is Ariel, you know? So it tells you that they haven't put in a second thought, you know, in crafting an email. For me, I'm gonna read that email, two minutes, you know? Uh, that is a lot of time for me because uh, I have a lot of things I, I need to be doing, but out of courtesy, I wanna read that email because I am looking for a student and you're basically writing me and I wanna consider it. And then I see all these careless mistakes and then it puts me off, you know, so, and this is applicable, not just to me, but to a lot of my colleagues, you know, we, we talk about this all the time. Uh, people, uh, mass mailing people, for instance, some of them would just copy all of us, put all of us in the, C, in the CC, um, and then say, yes, sir, slash madam, and then put in whatever. And, and then they will say, I want to do anything, whatever you have, you know, whatever research you have, I, I can do it, you know, so that's, that's desperation, you know, you're showing that you're desperate, and we don't need desperate students, we want bright students, they have confidence in their abilities, they have the skills needed, that are open to learning new things when they join us, uh, and then willing to uh, use that opportunity to uh, establish their careers um, and you know, set themselves up for life. Um, so those emails, I usually don't respond, I just delete them. Uh, but then the ones that are addressed to me, and I actually read it, and I see that the person is genuinely looking for an opportunity. So I look in the mail and they've described my research, 
and then say what they want to do, um, I respond. And if I don't have opportunity, which is what it is in most uh, cases, um, I just uh, tell them, uh, thank you for your interest in my group and that I don't have funding uh, to recruit new students. My lab is full at the moment and, you know, because my lab is always full. Um, and, and then uh, I, I wish them luck, you know, say all the best. Hopefully you find something you want. Um, and they, they reply and say, thank you for replying. They weren't expecting replies, you know, because people usually don't reply. Um, but then sometimes I have an opportunity and then those fortunate ones write me exactly the time that I have an opportunity. So it's just about luck in that case. And it's the same as the previous emails I've received, uh, but these ones are maybe timing just because of timing. Uh, they say they are looking for opportunities. And about that time, I'm, I'm, I have a master's position, a PhD position, then I schedule a call. I say, well, let's have a Skype call at that time, but now Zoom or Teams meeting, and then we can discuss further. So I would understand their interests and whether they have the right uh, motivation. Uh, it's not just that they want to start masters. Um, I also want to invest uh, research funding in training uh, the next generation of researchers. Um, so some people don't know what they want to do when they graduate. So it makes it difficult to put that money there. When I see people that say, well, I want to do a research in the industry, contribute to the economy in this way. I want to become a professor, contribute in training the next generation of researchers. It tells me that they have a better structure, even if they don't achieve it, but they have thought about it. And it actually attracts me to those kind of candidates uh, because they have a plan um, and I accept them. Uh, a lot of people consider GPA. Uh, I don't consider GPA. So you could have a, a two one, you know, as long as it gets you admitted, you could have a two one and I would take you um, as a student. First class is good, uh, but you know, two one is also good. Um, so, you know, so it depends. So I respond just basically uh, based on the outlook of the email. If it looks yeah. like somebody that has done their job, I take time to respond. It's only gonna take me uh, 30 yeah. seconds to reply. Um, and it's either I have a position, let's talk more, or I don't have a position, sorry. And sometimes I forward it to my colleagues if the candidate is good, especially for postdocs, uh, I forward it uh, to my colleagues and say, check out this candidate, you know, I know you're looking for somebody. Um, and even for grad school, I've connected so many people to uh, so many people, you know, who are doing graduate program all over Canada. Um, because I don't have opportunities doesn't mean I don't know people that have opportunities. Um, so I try to link people up um, as much as possible, um, as much as my time can afford. Uh, so, you know, whatever the case, you know, you try to keep a positive mindset when people respond to you that they don't have anything because they might have something later and revisit your email. Um, so always reply and thank them and say that you're still, you know, expecting, you know, hopefully something will happen. After a couple months, write them again and see whether they have something. Uh, but when you write and you don't get a response, um, try to follow up. And if you don't get a response, don't write again. Um, the person is not going to respond uh, because maybe they are busy. You know, maybe they have a headache that day, you know, and they don't feel like responding. Maybe they are in the hospital. You don't know, you know, people have personal problems too. You know, it's not just about our jobs. Uh, so write and remind and no response, move on. Uh, there are many, many, many other opportunities. Move on completely. So don't keep bombarding people with email all the time because they just keep deleting it. Um, so writing repeatedly, just like uh, when we make phone calls in Nigeria, uh, people call you and after ringing, they call you again and they call you again and they call you. So they think that, you know, if you keep calling, the person is going to answer it. No, it means they're in a meeting, maybe, you know, they're going to reply you. They will see a missed call. So um, that is how I see um, uh, emailing of uh, prospective supervisors. So you have to see that way that they are not available. You've made your message clear. If they're interested, they'll reply. If they're not interested, you move on, um, maybe after one reminder. Uh, and there are other opportunities that you could also explore. Um, and if you're lucky, they get back to you. If not, yeah, you just, life life goes on, you know? Perfect. Yeah. Thank you so much. So please, uh, um, if you have, uh, and this is for the participants, uh, if you have any questions for um, Professor Chibuike, please feel free to leave your question on the chat box. We are definitely gonna come to that and attend to that. Now we've talked about grad admission. We talked about contacting prospective supervisors. Another important area we also want to talk about, which is of course the most important is funding. What advice do you have for the participants in this area? How do they go 
what advice do you have as to how they go about the issue of um, funding? Okay, for Canada, um, so I know because I know in some places uh, people can apply for scholarships, and then when they get scholarships, you know they get admission. Uh, but for Canada, uh, in most instances, I think in most cases it's the funding coming either from your supervisors, a research grant, okay, or maybe there's a, an endowment like a, a scholarship endowment in the school or in the faculty or in the university uh, that they open up you know, for students to compete. So it's either that. Um, we have a few scholarship uh, agencies, uh, like uh, funding agencies like NSEC, SHEC, and CIHR, uh, which is a tri-agency uh, that have funding opportunities, but it's not available uh, to international students. It's mostly to permanent residents and Canadian uh, students. Uh, but um, some of them, uh, well, that, like for instance, Venia scholarship is open to everybody. Uh, so those are some of the very few available scholarship opportunities you could explore to study in Canada. Uh, and then, like I said, there are other foundations like the MasterCard um, and a number of other, but they're not as many as what you see in Europe, for instance, or in Asia, for instance. Um, so, but then for those opportunities, um, it's just about using all the resources available to prepare yourself for those opportunities. Like I said, it's about the same thing. Um, sitting on scholarship uh, committees, actually, since I was a grad student, I've always sat on scholarship committees as a graduate student representative. So I saw these things very early um, that everybody's ranking the same thing. So it's about your academic excellence, which is your GPA, pretty much, uh, your research excellence, which is your, the research you've done in the past, your publications, if you have any, conference presentations, if, if you have any, uh, no matter how small, it could be local conference, if you're regional or international or national conference, um, as long as it's a scientific conference or industry uh, con uh, conference um, that, are, that is relevant to your field. Uh, and then past opportunities you've had, like work opportunity, work, uh, work experience you've had. For instance, if you're a lawyer, for instance, I think your work experience might contribute um, towards your graduate education. Um, it's less in my field because um, many people don't get into uh, jobs <laughs> with a bachelor's degree, they have to do a master's maybe. Um, so, but all those things, they count. So you have to put them together, uh, not just by listing them, but by showing how they would contribute towards the opportunity you are seeking and genuinely telling them that if you secure these opportunities, are you gonna use this information and this knowledge to make this type of contributions in the future? Um, so making yourself clear about how the money is gonna be, um, because this is an investment. So about how that money given to you would multiply in the future uh, is very important. So you have to make it very clear. Uh, so the other one is your funding opportunities from your supervisor. So your supervisor um, has a funding, a grant, and they're looking for students. I think that is the majority of the case in Canada, the cases in Canada, uh, that then they, they are looking for somebody. So you have to work so hard to impress them, first by getting their attention through emails, like we've talked about. Uh, but secondly, also by be precisely and accurately describing your achievements and you know you know your accomplishments and telling them basically that you'll be the best candidate uh, when they hire you that you'll be the best candidate. It's just more like getting a job. Um, so it's just about packaging yourself and presenting yourself well, um, you know, in order to get somebody to notice you, pretty much. Yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much for those um, words of uh, advice. Uh, I mean, advice. So now um, we've talked so much about um, grad uh, admission, grad students, and um, I just want to emphasize that ASI Canada's objective is not just to bring in or attract grad, brilliant grad students to Canada, but also to keep them here when they are done. So be, I mean, of course, that means being able to move into the career, whether as postgrad, I mean, sorry, whether as postdoc student, visiting research scholar or faculty members. So for what advice will you give to current graduate students, of course, who are probably on the verge of completing their graduate studies and, you know, looking at the next step? or the next phase of their career. Right. Um, the, the number one advice would be to have a plan. Um, so I see a lot of people, undergrads, graduate students, even postdoc, 
who enter these things without a plan of what they would do when they finish. Because they tell you, well, well, let's start first and you know, we'll figure it out as we go. Uh, time flies uh, really fast. So if you want to wait until when you are almost finishing, then you are, you're almost running out of time because you're going to be busy throughout your graduate program. Uh, so it's good to have at least a tentative plan of where you might be headed. Uh, because those plans are going to help you structure your graduate experience. So, for instance, in my discipline, uh, if I said if I had said I want to do um, I want to go in the in the industry, for instance, uh, then during my graduate program there were opportunities to take an internship and spend three months in a company. Um, so those opportunities are there. Um, I didn't do them because I never planned to go to the industry. Some people did that, and then they got some industry experience and some connections, they expanded their network. And those things became important for them when they launched their careers, because they know who to go to. Um, I decided I was gonna be in academia and I structured my CV that way. So I started uh, attending many conferences, academic conferences, presenting my work, publishing extensively, uh, winning scholarships and awards. Um, and that basically put me in that trajectory, you know, to uh, focus on academic career. And same with government. If you want to do a government job, then you start putting yourself in that. There are internships where people could spend time in the government. Uh, Dr. Christian could tell you because he won one of those uh, uh, fellowships that gave him an opportunity to start his career after his PhD in the government. Uh, then he decided to switch to, to academia afterwards. So if you plan early, then it gives you a chance uh, to prepare yourselves uh, for those career opportunities after you graduate. So that would be the number one advice. Uh, the second advice is, or whatever the case, you have to work hard uh, to remain on top. Because when it comes time to hire somebody, it's only people at the, it's only the topmost candidates that are selected for any opportunity in academia, industry, or government. Uh, whatever the opportunity is, uh, only the best is selected. So make the most out of that opportunity you have currently. Uh, if it's about teaching, teach extensively. If it's about publishing, publish extensively. Uh, use your time wisely. There are many distractions, many, many, many distractions out there. As a student, I tried as much as possible to keep away from those distractions. And now it's even worse with social media blowing up and uh, everybody's showing what they have. And then you're feeling threatened and stressed. And, you know, those things are distractions, you know. So focus on your work, you know. Um, achieve all the things that set before you, all the plans you have. Um, discuss with your mentors and your supervisors to know, you know what you need to do. Uh, if you finish your project early, start a new one uh, because there's not a maximum of papers you can publish. There's no maximum of awards you can win or conferences you can attend or present. You know, so keep pushing yourself beyond your, your own expectation or have someone else push you beyond your own expectation. Don't settle, don't settle because except you don't have the ability you know, uh, physically you're not capable of doing it, which is understandable. But if you can, keep trying new things, keep doing more, uh, even when people are not doing it. Because, you know, you don't follow the, the crowd, you know, you try to create your own path and uh, stick to it. Um, because in the end, it's going to pay off. Uh, you just need to be uh, laser focused um, in achieving your goal. But at the same time, you know, you try to have fun. So I did everything I did, but at the same time, I was politically active. I was a student leader at every level of my study, uh, including my PhD. Um, and, you know, so I played a role in pretty much every social event as a, as a PhD student. Um, so I maintained a balanced uh, life while I pursued my studies and my research. I also tried to keep my network uh, in and out outside of the university uh, in order to just maintain my sanity. Um, and in the end, everything would work out. I think in the end, if you keep this as a the way you, you operate, it might not work out the first time, but you keep trying because at some point uh, it's gonna work out because what you need is one opportunity. You know, um, I didn't mention that I had applied to 45 positions altogether when I was looking for a job as a postdoc, 45 altogether. And I got about seven interviews and I got one job. You know, you need one, you know, in the end, you know, so that's what you should have in mind. Um, so it's not that where well, they rejected me once or twice and then you feel like you shouldn't try again. Um, so you just keep trying. So that would be my advice uh, to stay focused, you know, don't forget about the distractions, stay focused. Um, ask a lot of questions, ask a lot of questions because at this time as a student, uh, you, you can ask any question, you don't look stupid. 
because you're supposed to be a student, you know, so make it a job to ask questions so that people might think you're stupid, uh, but you're basically generating a lot of information when you do that. Um, and, uh, and in the end, you're enriching yourself and preparing yourself for the future. Thank you so much, um, TBK. This has been so long, uh, you know, a conversation and uh, there has been a lot, um, uh, I believe, um, experience to share, which um, will of course be very beneficial to the participants here. So at this point, I'll probably want to open the um, floor for question to the participants. Yeah. And um, we don't have much time left. So um, unfortunately we may not be able to take um, all the questions. So right. why don't we start with uh, you, Amadi Brian. Hello, uh, good afternoon, uh, good yeah. morning or good evening, depending on where you are. Sorry, I don't know what the time no is. Problem. Problem. So thank you, Professor uh, Udenigwe. Uh, thank you. Though I joined a bit late, uh, I really appreciate some of the words I heard from you. But I just want to know if you are open to uh, mentorship, because I know, though I'm a graduate student, but uh, uh, while I was uh, in Nigeria, I had challenges with respect to mentorship. Uh, most of the stuff you talked about now, we never knew about them while we were back home. And I know many students back home actually looking for mentors who can mentor them and guide them. So I don't know, I just want to know if you're open to mentorship, especially for students who are in your area of uh, specialization. Thank you. Thank you, yeah. Amadi. No, thank you, uh, Amadi. Um, I, I am, but I'm already doing a lot of that. Um, so I'm not sure if you know, but uh, I have over two dozen Nigerian students who have gone through my lab. And 50%, more than 50% of the students I've supervised in the past are international students. So I actually recruit from everywhere. I've recruited from 19 different countries. Um, five of those countries are from Africa. Uh, and so I mentor people actively. Like I already say, like I said earlier, my lab is full, you know, so because I, I constantly take people um, because this is the biggest part of my job. Um, um, I take it like, as a personal goal, you know, to uh, to mentor people, and as as you know, mentorship takes a lot of time. Um, so so I have I already have a lot of people, you know, that I'm currently mentoring here in my lab, but also remotely. Uh, a lot of people are connected with me through many universities uh, around the world uh, because I have collaborations uh, from all over. Um, but I also have a very strong uh, network in Nigeria because I'm Nigerian and. Uh, uh, with some universities in Nigeria, I spent some time in 2019 as a Carnegie Fellow at Alex Ekweme Federal University, and uh, I spent three months there. And I worked with a number of uh, students directly. I worked with, uh, including one undergraduate student that eventually published a paper with me um, from those three months of research. Um, so, so I I do my fair share of mentorship. Like I'd mentioned earlier, I don't mind doing it again. But it's just time is the biggest problem. Uh, but the goal is that when I train people, they train others um, and they provide the same information to others. I was happy to see that one of my former students uh, appeared in this, uh, in an earlier conversation with uh, Professor Christian, um, sharing her experience with uh, obtaining uh, scholarships, the Venia scholarship. Um, so I believe that the people I have trained or have mentored uh, could take the information and their experiences and share with others because it should be a chain reaction. Um, like I said, it doesn't have to be somebody that is at a higher position and you know, that you go up for mentorship. It could be a peer who already has that experience or who has already interacted with other people that have more experience. So, um, yes, I am open to mentorship. Uh, but like you said, you know, you know this opportunity. Now you have better experience than you had when you were in Nigeria. You could also be a mentor uh, to those uh, people directly and help them, you know, start bringing them up, you know, to the, the right direction. So that way, you know, we'll be able to spread it out, you know, and have a wider reach instead of one person uh, trying to do it all the time, then you have a lot of people do it um, uh, together. So that would be my, uh, my answer to that uh, question. Um, thank you. Thank you so Thank you very much. Sorry, Judy. please, the chat is disabled. Can you, I don't know, can you? Oh, okay. Yeah, um, and please, uh, we did not get his information if it can be dropped again for those of us who jo joined a bit late. Thank you. Okay, 
sorry. Um, okay, thanks for bringing that to our attention. Uh, Marion, is it possible to uh, enable the chat? Can you look into that? I, I, I will look into that. Okay. Um, okay, Mariam, I'll leave that to you. So uh, in addition to what Professor Chibike has said, on, one of our objective in ASA Canada is to provide that mentorship. Timing, of course, is of air science for term. Uh, we just been able, we just gotten our early, or, yeah, just some couple of weeks ago, we got our charitable status from the government of Canada. So we are now like full, set, fully set to carry on our mission. And what we basically going to be doing very soon is compiling a database of um, scholars and academics of African descent in Canada, African descent in Canada, and then the area of specialization. And through this database, we are able to pair them all with bright scholars outside the country, uh, bright scholars of African descent outside the country. So we're gonna be working on that. That is one of the programs we are currently developing. So please follow us on our social media. We'll probably be providing this information as and when they become due. Now let's um, take one more question. So this time around, we'll go to uh, Johnson. Uh, please, Johnson, can you unmute and uh, ask your question? Good evening, sir. Good evening. Hello. Hello. Yes, yes oh, we, we can, can hear you. Please go ahead. Okay, okay. Um, the question I wanted to ask is um, most of the emails are sent um, to Canadian professors. Um, I have a strong um, CGPA, I have research experience, but most times it comes back as uh, we have more competitive uh, students. So the question I want to ask is, what are those areas I need to concentrate on in order to be more competitive? Are there certain exams I need to write? Are there certain um, organizations I need to join? So to put myself ahead of other candidates or uh, for concentration purposes. Okay, so, so if I get this, so what discipline, what is your area of discipline? Okay, I'm um, I'm a physiotherapist. Physiotherapy. So most of the professors I ask are uh, usually in that area: kinesiology, physiology, physiotherapy area. Right. Thank you. Um, so, like you mentioned, your physiotherapy. So the response can be discipline specific because, from what I understand, uh, physiotherapy is a professional uh, program. So a master's in physiotherapy, I think, is considered a professional program. Uh, so in addition to all the things that we mentioned about securing funding or finding a supervisor, I think that's probably an element of uh, professional accreditation. I don't know, but it's something that you have to look into uh, that might affect uh, response you know, for people in your discipline. So it's discipline specific. Um, even, with, uh, even without those professional accreditations, people with high GPA sometimes they don't get a response, like I said. Um, so I think it's just a combination of uh, looking at whether there is any specific requirement in your discipline that you need to meet, like you mentioned, writing professional exams before you're regarded as qualified. Like I, I know nurses have to do that. You know, they have to be a registered nurse before they can do a master's um, uh, here. Um, so you have to check whether there are those requirements. And if they are not there, then it's just mostly about finding the right opportunity, maybe getting somebody to look at your package to make sure you have everything in order. But also it's about also, like I mentioned earlier, finding the right opportunity. Um, in that case, you have, just have to keep trying until you find uh, that opportunity, yeah. Okay, thanks, uh, Professor Chuket. I'm going to take some questions from the um, chat box here. And one is from uh, Habib Abdurraouf. Um, he said, it's apparent that graduate study is more of one's experience in research. How can I get more research experience besides the little one I got when doing undergraduate research? Um, to complement my scholarship opportunity? Yeah. So that's a good question. Very good question. And um, I, I, hear, I hear people ask me that question a lot uh, when, I, when I try to advise them. And I always tell them that if you finish your undergraduate research program and uh, now you're working somewhere, but you have some spare time 
and uh, you're looking at uh, you know bridging that gap you, you have, you could do volunteer research. Um, there are about 12 people doing volunteer research with me, and uh, more than half of them are from Nigeria. Uh, and they are where they are, and I assign the tax to them, and they, you know, they complete their task as a part of our research here. Things that could be done remotely, uh, like bioinformatics work. Um, so you could try that, you know, try to talk to your um, undergraduate supervisor or somebody that's doing research there that you know ver is very good in research, or some of us out here who might be willing to accept uh, volunteer researchers and try to find yourself some uh, research experience. You can gain some experience from that. Um, you could publish a paper from that. Uh, you could do, you could actually get a connection that will get you into grad school. Um, at least two people have uh, gotten into my lab through that means. They did not ask me for grad school, but they were volunteering with me and I suggested for them to apply because I enjoyed working with them. And one of them will start his PhD in September. Um, so uh, this September. So, you know, you have to forget about, because a lot of people are in a hurry to get things. Um, what I would suggest you do is live your life. If it is, you know, if you're working, you keep working. Um, if you're not working, I get that, that goes, you know, in a hurry to get something. But at the same time, sometimes you're in a hurry and you miss your opportunity. Uh, so if you slow down a little bit, then you can see that there are available opportunities that will help you gain experiences you weren't able to gain as an undergrad. And based on those experiences, then you can jumpstart your graduate uh, uh, career, you know, your, your graduate studies. Okay, so that would be the biggest, uh, I think the biggest way to, or well, the best, important, most important way to, to take this is to do volunteer research. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we go to the next question. The next question we have here is from Tolu Lope Oladukun, and her question is, I'm an international student in Nigeria and would like to know if I can apply for a second master's degree with food technology in a Canadian university. I had MSc in biochemistry with CGP of 4.10. My question is, can I apply with the MSc in, biotech, in biochemistry or should I apply only with BSc degree? You don't have a choice. Um, here in Canada, when you apply for graduate programs, you have to declare all your education. So you have to add all your transcripts. So you don't just have to cut one off and, so it's actually very important. It's actually going to help you, you know. So you see, you are applying for MSc here in food science or food technology. Uh, that you have an MSc in biochemistry or biotechnology is actually an advantage. Uh, so you sh yes, you need to declare it because it's a, a required. It's a requirement here. But at the same time, it would actually increase your opportunities if you want to do a second master's and you have a 4.1 is high, uh, a GPA. But like I said earlier, you know, if you also have a publication that adds uh, to that as well. Yes, so go ahead, do it. You know, it's um, it's actually good that you have a master's already and you're considering doing another master's um, in a related discipline. Okay, thank you. Now the next question um, we have here is coming from uh, Olamide Adegon. Uh, Olamide Adegon is one of our volunteers, uh, a volunteer with ASI Canada, though based outside Canada and we, want to use this opportunity to thank him for his uh, great deal of work, especially in designing our flyers and other volunteer time he has put into our activities. So his question is, I did my chemistry as an undergrad, published a research paper, and currently doing a research intensive master's program in industrial biotechnology, food processing. I have seven months left to complete my program. Will you advise I start contacting PhD supervisors now? I plan to have a career in the industry. Thanks. Yes, you, you can start now right away because seven months before you know it, and especially you're going to focus on writing. You're going to be doing a lot of uh, writing towards the end. Uh, so you should start now because uh, typically people approach me uh, right now. People are now approaching me for May admission, May 2022. You know, so I already accepted for September, for instance. Um, I'm not going to accept for January, but from now, people are already talking about May next year. So the earlier, the better, because you might not be successful the first time. Um, so you have to keep trying. So because of that, then in fact, if you're doing masters, maybe halfway into your masters, you need to start looking uh, for opportunities for PhD, because then you have courses already, you have research experience. So you have a story to tell of uh, some of the things coming out of that masters. Um, then you need to start looking for PhD opportunities, especially if you were gonna be an international student in the new place. Uh, because also if you get admitted, then the visa process is also there and all those things, you know, so 
you might want to continue um, with the application, uh, start the application as soon as possible, or start contacting supervisors as soon as possible. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Another question we have is from uh, Benjamin Danladi, and his question is: um, I want to know the role recommendation play in success of grad school application. They're, they're very important. Um, they're very, very important because even with high GPA um, and some research experience, if you don't have a positive attitude or you're not a teamwork um, person, you don't work well in teams, uh, nobody would want to recruit you because uh, we work in teams a lot. Uh, that's why I told you that the GPA is not high up in my list when I recruit people. Um, it's actually what the referees say about their attitude. Um, do they respect others? Do they work well in a team? Um, are they motivating to others? Or even if they're not, are they not going to cause problems, you know, in the team or, you know, so something like that is very important to see in a reference letter when people can vouch for you and say, this is the best person I've ever worked with, even if they're not the strongest in the class, their attitude is excellent. You know, I prefer that, you know, because whatever science you're going to do in my lab, I will teach you that. You come with some, but I'll teach you the most of it. Um, so if you're willing to learn, you're going to learn it. So you don't have to be excellent at my work in order to work in my lab. No, then what are you doing here? You're not a student anymore. You know, so basically like a professional. But if you're coming to do master's or PhD, I expect you know some things, but I expect you're going to learn a lot from here. Uh, the majority of my worry is whether you'll be able to, you know, work well with my team. You know, um, because it's a very uh, positive work environment that I have uh, that I've managed to set up and maintain. Um, and those things, we see them in the reference letters where they say that this is a, a good person and uh, you'll be able to work well, they are willing to learn um, and all the other things that might support your application. Yes, yeah, so it's a very important consideration. Okay, so the next question we have here is probably coming from someone who is a free, I mean, a, a mixture, a mixed breed of uh, Professor Chibiki and Professor Christian, and that's the person of uh, Olusha Son Abib. Olusha Son Abib, says I'm a former biochemist and now a law graduate. Um, are there opportunities for scholarship for either thesis-based or course-based LLM? So LLM is a master degree in law. So uh, maybe I will have to take this question here. Yes. You know, um, Olusha Son, you have two great combination of um, skills that will be relevant for um, grad study in law. Uh, but what I would advise you to do, I don't know what your area of focus is, but if you can focus on a very emerging area now, which is biotechnology law. Now you have those two background as a biochemist and a law graduate. So if you can focus on maybe something like biotechnology law, you have great deal of chance or opportunity of excelling in that field because of your background and um, I would recommend you go for thesis-based LLM because thesis-based LLM, you have more chances of securing scholarship with thesis-based LLM than course-based LLM. Most schools are not um, open to giving scholarship for course-based LLM. And even when they do, the amount is very minimal compared to what they, they give to thesis-based students. So think about thesis-based LLM in biotechnology law. That would be a very great deal. That would be a, a good area for you considering your background. Um, Richard Abdul, uh, yeah, Rich, Rich Abdul, or I guess that's Richard Abdul. Say thanks, Professor Udeniwe for this very insightful session. You spoke about your transition into doing something more practical and impactful in the short term. What were those steps you took in ensuring that you were grounded in the area you are transitioning to in order to secure admission in the new area? Okay, that's a good question. Um, as a biochemist, you know, so I was fortunate I studied biochemistry. As a biochemist, um, you'd be able to study any, pretty much any, um, any course in uh, any uh, life sciences and physical sciences because you have most of the background needed. Uh, like as a biochemist, I took so many chemistry courses. I took so many microbiology courses in addition to biochemistry courses, and uh, that prepared me for pretty much anything. Um, so when I switched from biochemistry to chemistry, it was very easy because I, I had the foundation. Um, and then when I switched from chemistry to food and nutrition, it was actually the easiest because um, most of the things my colleagues were struggling to understand were biochemical concepts. 
and I taught those things, you know, so it was very easy for me to make that switch. Uh, for some others, like uh, the person that moved from biochemistry to law, that's totally different because you kind of jumped uh, a whole new, to a whole new discipline. Um, that might, that's a different experience, and I don't know how people do that. It's actually very good. Uh, my wife did something like that, um, jumping from chemistry to social sciences. Um, so that might require some level of preparation, reading something, you know, background information in order to prepare yourself. But that wasn't my experience. So my experience was a, a little different and I was able to use all my skills. Till today, I still use biochemistry, chemistry, food science and human nutrition in my research every day. Everything I studied came together into this career that I have now, even though they're not the same. Uh, I know in Nigeria, you cannot switch disciplines. Um, if you study biochemistry in bachelor's, you have to go all the way to PhD. Uh, otherwise, they will ask you to do a postgraduate diploma first, uh, but it's not applicable here. Um, if you have the requisite uh, background based on the courses you took, so your transcript will be checked and then the relevant courses settled. And if you have those relevant courses, you can study anything you want as long as you meet their uh, requirements. Um, so that was why I was able to make all those switches without losing anything. I did my master's for two years. I did my PhD for three years um, and I posed that for one year. So everything was still you know, within or even earlier than expectation um, without any, uh, any delays. So you have to consider those as well. We, we are, sorry, we are running out of time. So we, the last question we're gonna take is from uh, DOM. And uh, the question is this, for those graduates applying for research-based courses, it means coming out with a good research proposal how can we come up with a good research proposal, especially when there are a few open access articles or journals? Excuse me. Yeah, um, that's also a very, a very good question. Um, but, you know, there are a few open access. It's a very big issue generally in the scientific community because uh, open access is very important in, in, so that people can have access, especially because all this uh, research was done with public funds. Um, so something that still has to be uh, overcome. Uh, but while you were working in, say, a place like Nigeria and you don't have access, um, you could request for articles from the authors because people could send the authors' copies to you, and you could use it, you know, to write your work. Um, and you know, of course, you're not expected to know everything in the discipline, so you just need a, only a select uh, number of articles in order to accomplish your research proposal. Uh, but while writing your research proposal, you should also have in mind that your supervisor has their research uh, program, so you have to write it, you know, to be within the context of what is done already in that lab, so it will be relevant. And in some cases, it's just a way for the supervisor to know what you are thinking and how you write and whether you have the background skill, but not necessarily what you're going to do. Because when you come to my lab, you don't do what you plan to do, you do the work that is happening in my lab. So I'm going to discuss with you and we'll think about the best fit and you see all the project options and then you fit yourself somewhere. Uh, so your research proposal is mostly about demonstrating your skills um, and your ability to write and do research and understand the problems uh, in the field and be able to craft a, a, you know, a proposal or a way to address those problems. Um, so do the much you can, you know, and then request for articles. The people often send articles to people. Um, and then try to maximize the opportunities you have. It doesn't have to be everything. We understand that there are those limitations and that we take that into consideration when we assess some people. I wouldn't ask a master's student to write me a winning proposal because they're just a master's student. Uh, but I know that there's, there's some basic information that uh, that proposal should have uh, given the opportunities available or that way I'll be able to assess what they can do when they have all the opportunities when they arrive in my lab, yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Chim. We tend to be, we, it seems apparently to be running out of time. I see there are still some couple of questions from David, uh, direct mes question, message question from David um, and Afiz Oduola, as well as Oladimeji, who has his hands up. Um, I must apologize, unfortunately, that we may not be able to go beyond this because of uh, time constraints. Um, uh, Chibike, Professor Chibike has actually done much, uh, you know, giving us one hour, 30 minutes of his very busy lab time today, and we won't want to overstretch our lot. But um, please, um, Mariam has posted uh, Professor Chibike's LinkedIn page on the chat box there. Yeah, please feel free to connect with Professor Chibike and, uh, you know, um, um, uh, send him your questions. I'm very sure he will 
make time out of his busy schedule to uh, respond to that. I hope I'll not, by saying this, I'm not adding to your heavy, <laughs> more responsibility to your heavy workload, Professor Chibike. Okay. So, um, <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, thank you so much. Um, we have uh, over 150 participants registered for this uh, webinar from different parts of the world. Though not all of them attended, but we will normally do, uh, these webinars are usually recorded at the end of the presentation, we upload them to our uh, YouTube page and then send the link to all registered participants. So if you join in late or somehow you have technical issues being able to join, uh, please feel free uh, to connect with us. We are still going to send out the link to the recorded uh, uh, um, to the record of this webinar on our YouTube channel. And also please connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, or LinkedIn. Uh, this is the first in the series of our Meet the Prof webinar. We are also planning another webinar with uh, another brilliant, successful scholar in Canada, of African descent in Canada. So please stay, follow us and stay tuned once this, um, that webinar, is, the plan is concluded, we'll send out the registration details. I know many of you are joining us from different parts of the world, from Canada, from Nigeria, from Ethiopia, Ghana, and even others from Asia and Europe. We thank you very much for taking time to attend the first or inaugural ASI Canada Meet the Prof um, Fireside Chat. And to Professor Chibike, we thank you very much for taking time off your busy schedule to uh, attend this webinar. We have all, learn from your rich knowledge, from your experience. And um, thank you very much for the time. Nice so um, this is where we are going to bring the end to this um, webinar or this fireside chat. Thank you all very much. And please connect with us. And uh, we hope to see you in our subsequent webinar. From Calgary, Canada, goodbye. <laughs>